those of us who are here will get rolling. For those of you who know, again, I'm Dr. Stephen Holt. I am the chair of the North Northeast Oversight Committee. And as the chair of the North Northeast Oversight Committee, we would have started. Um, as the facilitator for tonight gave us opportunity to get together. So I'm kind of here in a dual role tonight. I facilitate the work of, or have facilitated up until uh, this past month, the work of the North Northeast CDI. And uh, as the chair of the Oversight Committee, then I operate in that role also. So uh, I hope everyone's had a chance to sign in out front. If you haven't, please make sure you do before you leave. There's going to be an opportunity. Uh, trust you've also grabbed an agenda and some of the packet that covers what we are doing tonight. Tonight is an extremely important meeting, and we want to be uh, very clear around our conversation. Um, and so if you look at the agenda, you see what we are intending to cover. I'm not going to read each item on the agenda at this moment, but I do want to bring your attention to the public comment section. If you have, uh, as we are um, progressing, if you have thoughts and or something you want to share or questions you have, uh, that public comment section will be the opportunity to engage. Until then, I ask you to just uh, be very attentive and to uh, stay with us as we work through the items. Let me just kind of speak briefly to um, the history or what brings us to this moment. I think many of us are aware of the gentrifying reality of Portland and specifically North and Northeast Portland. That since 1990 specifically, there have been 15,000 families that have moved out of North and Northeast Portland. 15,000 families. An area that was once 65% African American is now 15% African American. Some through sell, some through loss opportunities, others through um, predatory lending, so forth and so on. But um, there has been concerted effort and energy to address the issue and not reverse gentrification, because I don't think that's going to happen, but to at least give opportunity to African-American families that would like to move back into North and Northeast Portland. Our charge as the Oversight Committee of, as it relates to housing is to make sure that the promises that were made become the promises that are kept. And there are four specific areas that we have uh, been concentrating on. One is uh, opportunities for ownership for people of color, African Americans, specifically those who lived in North and Northeast Portland who would like to move back to make sure that we are uh, creating opportunities and pathways to secure ownership. The other is affordable rental housing um, to make sure that those also individuals who would like to be back in North and Northeast Portland have an opportunity to take advantage of uh, the possibilities and have an affordable rental unit. The third strategy was displacement prevention. So the people who still live in North and Northeast Portland, what can we do to help underwrite, support, and empower those families to stay in their homes? And then our last charge was around uh, what is called land banking. And land banking simply means to purchase some land and set it aside, to take it off the market so that other um, developers could not develop it for market rate development, and that at some point it could be developed for affordable units, either ownership and or renting. Uh, that's the work we've been a part of for the last four years, many of us who are on the Housing Oversight Committee. That's the work we've been a part of for uh, the last four years. And as a result of that, uh, I believe we've got 1,500 doors that are in the pipeline, or 1,500 units that are in the pipeline. That may not sound like much, especially when I just said 15,000 families have been impacted. But 1,500 is much better than zero, and better than two, or five, or 10, or 20. At least it turns the needle and begins to move things forward. Now, it is not enough. And in order for us to make significant impact, there has to be significant revenue, significant revenue and revenue streams. And that's part of what we're going to be talking about tonight is um, dollars to help continue the work that is in front of us. So again, this is an important meeting. It's significant. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. Welcome. Um, and to that extent, let me introduce Leisha Posey, who is one of the co-chairs of the North Northeast Community Development Initiatives. And I will uh, let you share some words with the group. Good evening, everyone. Thank you guys for all showing up tonight. I'm really happy to see so many people in the audience. 
it kind of really just warms my soul, especially to see so many friendly faces that I uh, know and interact with often. Um, so the North by Northeast Community Development Initiative Oversight Committee uh, was formed in 2017 um, as an oversight committee that would um, work to see that the work and action that was put in place in the action plan would come to fruition. So we have been in place a little over a year now. Um, we have members around the table here. I don't know, Dr. Holt, if we're giving everyone an opportunity to, to introduce themselves and if this would be the appropriate time. But if you're on the committee, if you would mind just saying your name, um, and we can start over there with Maurice. Maurice Robinson. We didn't hear you back. Maurice Rahming. Karen Ward. Gwen Thompson. Oscar Arana. Jennifer Huang. Shonisha Smith. No, it needs to be clean. Okay, sorry. Shonisha Smith. And if there's anyone on the phone, are we having phone folks in tonight? Okay. So um, the action plan, if you haven't seen it, is available. It's on the web, uh, Prosper Portland's website. Um, but I just highlight real quickly the five bucket areas that the action plan covers, and that's to promote property ownership and redevelopment in the Interstate Corridor URA, support business ownership and growth in the Interstate Corridor URA, invest in new and existing home, homeowners in the URA, the Interstate Corridor URA, advance community livability projects, and catalyze uh, business, whole, uh, business hubs. Each one of those buckets has an allotment of money to go with them. There's $32 million total for this action plan. Uh, and so our task really is to kind of oversee, uh, working in concert with Prosper Portland, that these dollars are spent um, uh, to provide economic opportunity and wealth creation in the African American community. Thank you, Alicia, for the overview. Appreciate it. It is great to have uh, a joint meeting tonight and the opportunity to participate together. I'm going to have the um, housing committee, if you will identify yourselves as well, It'd be great. Begin over there. Come back around. Sheila Holden. Get your mic close to you. Marlon Holmes. Jillian Siraj. Lisa Bates. Appreciate you being here tonight. And we also have in our community, which are in our meeting tonight, several members of the Project Working Group, which has just recently been established to address um, what is called the Hill Block property. And it's located on Russell between Williams and Vancouver. I won't ask you to identify yourself, uh, to give your names, but if you just kind of put your hand up, those are on the Project Working Group. Excellent. Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate it. <clears throat> we're going to keep rolling and we're going to begin with our first presenter, who is Gina Woolley. And uh, many, of her, many of us know her. Gina, if you'd come right up to the podium. Are you going to sit here? Okay. Welcome, Gina. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, <clears throat> What I'm going to try to do in 15 minutes is give you a really quick overview of urban renewal. As many of you know, I have developed with urban renewal dollars in, not on? No, you're on. Okay. This won't be close. Thank you. Um, I've done projects with urban renewal dollars in this area, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about one of those projects, Vanport Square, a little bit later to talk about how those dollars can be used in a commercial project to really provide community benefit. And uh, the typical formats for doing commercial revitalization, I'm not going to be talking much about housing projects. Housing projects as a function of the urban renewal dollars are relatively a, a, new, um, a new initiative. So uh, it, it hasn't been until the interstate urban renewal district that housing dollars were actually, part of those urban renewal funds were allocated that 
uh, for housing. And actually, uh, it started off at 30%, and now in the interstate, it is at 70%. So it's been amended a couple of times over, since the uh, interstate urban renewal district was formed. Um, and it's directly related to the kind of uh, crisis that we have with gentrification and the pushing out of black families and poor families out of inner north and northeast Portland. So I want to just kind of, uh, I'm going to uh, talk generally about what urban renewal was supposed to do, um, just as a tool, and how it's been used, because urban Urban renewal has essentially been weaponized around the country in, in many ways as a tool to remove poor communities from the center of cities. Um, so those areas of the city that are the, the poorest, the blackest, uh, the um, least, uh, have the least amount of influence have generally been gr more greatly affected by urban renewal around the country than other neighborhoods. Um, and that was true of Portland in the early years, and that's why we are where we are today. So um, urban renewal is basically a state authorized uh, redevelopment and finance program. It uh, was originally designed uh, in the um, 19, late 1940s to um, basically help cities improve and redevelop the inner core of the cities. So that was, was what it was intended to do. Um, and it was to redevelop those areas that are physically deteriorated, that were suffering from economic stagnation, that were considered unsafe or poorly planned. Um, it, it doesn't take much imagination to think that if we're looking at uh, public officials who want to remove folks from the core of the city, they want to bring other more economically prosperous activities to the core of the city that those areas would end up being targeted. So in, um, in the 90s and 1950s and the 1960s, uh, the concept of urban renewal was used across, uh, used by cities across the country to um, assemble large tracts of urban land to basically redevelop supposedly redevelop and revitalize the inner cities. And generally speaking, as I've already said, those areas targeted were for redevelopment were generally the poorest and the blackest neighborhoods in those cities. <clears throat> Prosper Portland was established in 1958 as Portland's Urban Renewal Development Agency. So, um, and three of the four earliest federally funded urban renewal efforts in Portland were focused on inner north and northeast Portland. And those included the Albina Neighborhood Improvement Plan, the Emanuel Hospital Urban Renewal District, the Model Cities, and the Model Cities uh, Development, Neighborhood Development Plan. So in Portland, between the 1950s, uh, the, the Memorial Coliseum uh, general obligation bond, this was prior to the time that PDC was established in the late 1950s, so they did a general obligation uh, bond to fund the Memorial Coliseum project, um, and that was in 1956. So between that time and the early 1970s, when, which is when the urban renewal, the Emanuel Urban Renewal Project took place, there were at least three massive construction projects that essentially destroyed the Albina neighborhood as it existed at the time. And of course, that community was the center of the black community um, in, in that era. And it's interesting, I mean, it's important to understand that the Vanport flood happened in 1948. And most of the population that moved into in, to the Albina area, the black population, came out of the Vanport projects. And so that with the uh, real estate code pro prohibiting brokers from selling houses, we ended, the black community ended up concentrated in the Albina neighborhoods. And so we're seeing starting in 1956 uh, where those con concentration, where that concentration of community is, that there are beginning to be public actions that essentially change um, 
the fabric that, uh, of the inner Northeast area. So um, I think that the major projects, I guess I should go to my next, whoops, sorry. I'm not real good at using these things, so. Can I go back? Okay. Um, so th uh, these are the these are the major urban renewal projects and or areas. Uh, the Veterans Memorial Coliseum, as I said, was a general bond. It was financed by general obligation bonds that were passed by that that, that voters have to. Just like our school bonds, they have to actually vote on them. So, of course, the black population in those days was not large, and it was voted to build that coliseum. Uh, the Legacy Emanuel Urban Renewal District was specific to providing expansion land for the hospital. Uh, so, in, in, in effect, um, the Portland Development Commission started talking to the hospital in the early 1960s about uh, they had heard rumors that the hospital was thinking about leaving the city, and what they wanted to do is provide land to give the hospital room to expand, uh, you know, in, in terms of their 50-year expansion plan, so they would, be, they would stay in the city as a tax base. So essentially, um, that, was, uh, that happened in the, the city, um, submitted its application for the urban, the, ur the legacy Emanuel urban renewal district to HUD in 1967, and the first dis the first displacement um, uh, or the clearing, the land clearing, the d demolition of homes and commercial buildings started in the early 1971. The urban, uh, the Emanuel, uh, Legacy Emanuel District was only 55 acres, and you're going to see these urban renewal districts get larger and larger because the interstate urban renewal district is three, uh, over 3,000 um, acres, and it, so it makes a lot of difference. So the next one was the um, Oregon Convention Center urban renewal. Uh, it was created in 1989. It consisted of 410 acres. Um, I'm sorry, I think I skipped one. No, I didn't. These are, these are large uh, major dis projects or districts. Uh, it was, it was the Oregon Convention Center, and this is the first time, so you see there's quite a gap between the projects that happened in the 70s, and then it's almost 20 years before there is another district formed in North Northeast, and it is formed not for the black community or for folks that are living in now further up in North and Northeast, but it is formed for the Lloyd District. And it is formed uh, in order to provide a footprint and to assemble land for the convention center and the convention center hotel. And it was done in conjunction, which and it, uh, makes sense. The, the TriMet was extending the light rail uh, east, and that light rail was running directly through the Lloyd District, and so essentially there was, it made sense to actually set the table for the redevelopment of the Lloyd District uh, as, as part of that. So uh, as I said, that district was created in 18, 1989, and it, the last debt that was issued on that was in 2013, and that consisted of 410 acres. It's basically the Lloyd District from Broadway down to the river, 15th, and down uh, on the other side to the Gulf. Uh, so the, the, the last one, of course, is the Interstate Corridor Urban Renewal District. It was created in 2000. Um, it is the largest. It has 3,990 acres. And it ha it's long t uh, the last long-term debt that can be issued currently um, is in June of 2021, which is part of what I understand this project is, I mean, this is about. So just quickly let me run through. Can you click to the next slide? So these are typical ways that you do use urban renewal funding. So for example, when the OCC district, with the Oregon Convention Center district was funded, we had 
uh, advocacy groups in North, Northeast. We had the Northeast Economic Development Alliance at the time. It included partners from all of the community organizations. And one of the things that we basically did was require that they run that urban renewal, the OCC urban renewal district, up to MLK. So actually, originally, the OCC Convention Center included commercial sites on MLK, and actually about seven of those sites were assembled, so money was spent to land bank. Those sites for future development in Vanport was originally one of those sites. Uh, so that's a tool that you can use to land bank for um, developments that are eventually going to provide community benefit. So it assembles, assembling and land banking sites, um, are creating, re, uh, you, you typically re, uh, create redevelopment di divisions. So some of this money, it, there's been a number of studies done on every one of these urban core, uh, commercial corridors in North and Northeast uh, about how to revitalize them using the urban renewal dollars. And you can go to the website, PDC's website, and it has all of those studies under each of the urban renewal districts. What's important to understand is when you, the urban renewal plan is really the heart and soul. It tells you what the objectives of that urban renewal district is and really it gets set when that plan is put in place unless it's amended. And you essentially can't do things outside of what that plan was put in place for. So the OCC district, for example, was primarily created for the convention center hotel and to revitalize the Loy District, but it has a third objective that talked about helping to build wealth, um, it, you know, uh, and so that, uh, that, that had to do with the MLK sites. Um, so the process is usually you land bank, you create a redevelopment vision. This is what has historically been done by, by PDC. You, then you RFP out those sites for redevelopment. So a lot of the sites that get RFP'd, for example, the, a big one that's on the table now is the post office site. So this is, you know, when you're, it's not, this is the time that people need to be paying attention because essentially the table's gonna be set. By the time everybody's worried about what it is and isn't doing it, it's long past the time to pay attention. Um, so on the post office site, this whole ramping process for what's going to happen. You've got a developer that's been chosen uh, to develop a vision. This is the time for people to be involved if they have concerns. Um, and then you set up an MOU. The first thing that happens is you set up an MOU, so you create a concept, you compete for the development rights, and you basically then um, have some time to prove up your concept. And after that, if you can prove up your concept and, may, and show that it's financially viable and that you have the resources uh, gathered together from various sources to develop it, you end up with a development and disposition agreement. The important objective that I think there's, that need, there needs to be more attention paid by all of those who are in the advisory process is to oversee the desired project results. So every one of these projects it, and um, is committing to provide certain kind of community benefits, particularly if they're urban renewal dollars, and people need to be paying attention and holding folks accountable for producing those results. Can you go to the next slide? I know I'm a couple minutes old, but I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll so there, there are, um, in these public-private partnership models, there are, Development outcomes, which means basically you're trying to create something that, that the PDC's gone through visioning processes with community stakeholders and they've identified what the community wants to see developed. And so it's really about the programming on the site and essentially um, the types of uses that you're putting on the site in a commercial development project. And basically your development are, outcomes are when, you, when the project's produced is how many of the, I mean, how much of that vision is getting achieved? How many of those objectives are really getting achieved? So that's an important. And then there are desired community um, economic development uh, outcomes and those include jobs and construction, workforce participation. These are the ones where people talk about the most, but actually, they're the ones that everybody's attention's focused on, but the, and, and DMWESB, 
But you also have the sustain sustainability features. You have neighborhood revitalization. Does the project actually revitalize the neighborhood? Who does it revitalize the neighborhood for? Um, you have a commercial affordable retail space. Is it simply gentrifying the neighborhood or is there opportunities to provide affordable spaces? These are all things we should be thinking about today for these kind of projects. And then the wealth creation opportunities. Who owns it? Who, who benefits from the ownership of the project? Um, next slide. This is, the, I'll do this quickly. So. Um, Many of you know about Vanport Square, but I don't think a lot of people really know what, what, what was involved with Vanport Square. So Vanport Square, myself and Ray Leary were the developers um, under Vanport Partners, LLC. Uh, the first phase, we, uh, we actually competed for the development rights of both the block that Alberta Commons is on and the block that Vanport Square sits on. So it was a two block RFP, those sites had both been assembled with urban renewal dollars. Uh, Vanport Square in focused on the mid block and it was the renovation of what used to be the Marco Machine Works. So the, there are two buildings on that site. The bigger building was there. It used to be a light industrial building. It, it originally was a car dealership, then it became a light industrial building. Um, the new, this was, we also created a 15,000 square foot new building on the north end of the block. These, these, pro, these two buildings are condominiumized. So they are commercial condominiums. They were intended for local and minority business owners. Um, the, um, they involved new market tax credits, and so that allowed these units to be much more affordable to be purchased by the small businesses. So we, we structured deals that allowed the small business owners to buy those units over time um, at a very low interest rate. And rather than taking um, the profit out as the developers, we passed that value. You make, the way you make money in real estate is you you develop it, you hold it, and then you sell it, and you get the upside. All of the small business owners that are now in Vanport will be the beneficiaries of the Vanport Square. They all own their spaces. They will get the upside, which there's already been appreciation and value of those units. There's 15 units, and of those units, 12 um, of the units are minority and or women owned. Uh, there are um, six minority owned units in there, and actually seven if you count. We, we still hold one, uh, two of the units that did not sell before the downturn, the economic downturn. So um, next slide, please. This shows you the capital stack. So um, that shows you how the project was structured. We put part of our development fee back in to make this project viable. And that happened at the last minute because the, uh, this deal couldn't even be done today. And, but these are the kind of deals that need, we need to be looking at doing um, if you want to create more ownership in the community. Thank you very much. I'm going to give about five minutes for our, any questions from the oversight, the joint oversight committees for Gina. I have one question. <laughs> you said the deal could not be done today. What's kind of a brief explanation of that? Well, this was, we, we, we actually created a model that had never been done any place in the country. We work with United Family of Funds. Uh, Carl Talton was at United Family of Funds at the time. He was running United uh, Family of Funds. Um, and uh, so there was a lot of support to do something in North, Northeast. Um, we, this condominium model, new market tax credits by the law cannot be, you, you can't recapture those within the seven year new, uh, new market tax credit period, so you can't sell them. So we had to create a legal model that allowed us to essentially parcel out debt to each of the owners. So it was the equivalency of a sale, but it wasn't a sale. The model has now been used by others. Uh, Jim Winkler, who's a big developer in town, has done projects using the same model, except 
he hasn't he's gathered up the owners like the the Daisy Kingdom building downtown is a perfect example it's it, it was a bunch of um, art oriented um, organizations and um, they he basically made sure that they took the risk in our case Ray and I took the risk so I mean there was a lot of there was a lot of uh, opportunity for this to fail it was a very um, the you know it had never been done so there were a lot of risks and the other thing is the interest rate uh, I don't you know these businesses were able to buy their units with the help of PDC's money and we blended that with the new markets at under 1% interest. So, you know, it's a deal that will not be replicated, but that doesn't mean you can't do deals like this. It just means you need a bigger subsidy from the other partners uh, in order to make that work. Thank you very much. Another question. So, um, first I wanna say thank you, Ms. Willie, for the historical work that you've done, not just here tonight, but in, in a number of other instances and sort of putting together these stories. And I really appreciate that you, um, I think very, very accurately named the urban renewal history as being racist and classist. One of the things I want to lift up in that history is that in every turn and every um, major urban renewal designation that you described here, there were people in the black community who were um, very aware of what was happening, who were protesting what was happening, who accurately predicted the results that would happen in terms of community dissolution and in terms of displacement. Um, and I think it's really important to also raise up that history of resistance and resilience. Always, um, it was always there. Yeah, absolutely. And um, knowing, that, knowing some of that history, and I'll, I'll just speak to the ICURA formation and the extent to which um, anti-displacement measures were jettisoned from the actual project work almost immediately um, upon creating the district. Um, when we talk about things like the plan is what tells us what we're going to do, knowing that things can be dropped out of a plan, or talking about paying attention and holding accountable, have you found in your work ways to make um, accountability not just about aspirations or soft targets, but to create um, hard accountability measures that would inform us as we go forward into what needs to be built into um, a plan for any kind of expansion area. Thank you for your um, comments. Um, it has to be built into the development disposition agreement that PDC signs with the developer. I mean, honestly, we had, uh, in our project, we had so many things that we had to, so many targets that we had to meet. I think we were uniquely held accountable to meet specific targets in the neighborhood. And, um, it, you know, the, the, um, the issue is that you have to pay for that. that. Those things all cost more money. So, you know, to do all the things we want to do to create community benefit, those things cost money. And you have to factor that into the development cost of the project. And that has to be recognized by both the partners in the agreement. It has to be recognized by the developer and it has to be re recognized by, the, by Prosper Portland. And I think we're there. I, I mean, I think we're in a different era than we were in the past, but I think now you have to make sure that you get the right developers at the table because people wave their hands about what they're gonna do. When you RFP out a site, if you aren't more prescriptive, there's always this tension and discussion about should you be should we be really really prescriptive and does it limit the developers who will actually want to compete for this? If you're not going to be prescriptive in in terms of specifically what has to be produced, then be prescriptive in terms of creating partnerships with local folks, you know, so that other so that there's an opportunity. Some of the larger projects are not projects that we have a lot of folks that are able to do. Even, even the project that we did, when we competed, we, got, we partnered with a big developer because it was going to be a two-block development site, and we really knew we didn't have the financial capacity to go to the bank and do that. But we, um, we took the lead in terms of defining the vision and making sure that the things we committed to do in those meetings in the community and the, that the 
the input that had been provided through the various community stakeholder processes, that we met those to the letter. Uh, I mean, you know, that we tried to meet as many of those that were, that were financially feasible. So I do think having the community benefit piece, so for example, on the Alberta Commons, the community benefit piece came after the agreement was signed. And so you, then you had to go through a process. I mean, I think Prosper Portland, to their credit, rec you know, and given all the noise in the community, said, we've got to go back and do this. And, um, you know, and we're going to make this right. And they, you know, they've paid to do that. But they shouldn't have paid. The developer, if they're going to take advantage of developing that site in this community and use the public dollars to do it uh, or uh, get that public subsidy as a, you know, a, a footstep into the community, they should be, they should be uh, putting something on the table as well. Thanks, Gina. Appreciate it. Great presentation, and we may bring you back with other questions. Next on our agenda is Elaine Howard. And you're going to talk to us about how TIF works in Portland. Elaine, thank you for being here tonight. Welcome. Hi, thank you for inviting me to come tonight. My name is Elaine Howard. I'm an urban renewal consultant, and I do urban renewal work all over the state of Oregon. So I've done some work in Portland, but I also do work in Klamath Falls and Astoria and Pendleton and Brookings, so um, all, all over the state. So what I am covering is just a very, very quick overview of how urban renewal works, how TIF works, and what a substantial amendment is, and how you increase your maximum indebtedness. Whoops, so somebody did that for me. So. Um, it's hard to see the bars on this, but uh, what this has on the left is a, a large bar that says total tax rate. So the way the financing portion of urban renewal works is you take the total tax rate. So if, you, if there's no urban renewal, you take your total tax rate times the assessed value of your property, and the taxes go to all the different taxing jurisdictions. That's how organs property tax system works. In urban renewal, at the point that an urban renewal area is formed, the assessor establishes what's called a frozen base. So if you look down at the, this one doesn't seem to have a point here, but down at the bottom there's a, a little chart bar that says frozen base. The taxes off of that continue going to the different taxing districts. And at the point that the urban renewal area is established, any increase in value within that area, the taxes off of that increased value goes to the urban renewal agency, or in this case, um, Prosper Portland, or the Housing Bureau, to do projects, programs, and pay for administration within the urban renewal area. So the way Urban renewal works in Oregon is it's called a division of taxes. It's not an increase in taxes that people pay. It's those taxes that people pay get divided into different buckets. So the bucket on the bottom is the bucket of the value of the district when it's established. The bucket on the top is as values grow in the area, those funds get to be used in that area by either the Prosper Portland or the Portland Housing Bureau. Next slide. These were some questions that um, came up and these answers I'm going to expand upon because it's not really precise here, but do urban renewal areas increase property taxes? I think this is a twofold question. So I think the first concern is if you own property in an urban renewal area, will the fact that there is urban renewal that covers your property, increase your property taxes? And the answer to that is no. And the answer to that is no because of that division of taxes thing that we talked about on the first slide, which is the way tax increment works is whatever your property taxes are, a portion gets divided to urban renewal, a portion gets divided to the taxing districts. If urban renewal went away, you would still pay that same amount of taxes, it just gets divided back to all the existing taxing districts. So that's the county, the city, uh, metro, the port. So the fact that you're either in or outside of an urban renewal area doesn't impact 
what your property tax bill is going to be. So every property within the city of Portland has urban renewal on their property tax bill. So only 15% of the property um, by acreage and by assessed value in Portland can be in urban renewal, but every single property tax bill for the city of Portland has urban renewal on the property tax bill. And I give whole hour presentations about why that is, so I, I won't go into that unless somebody asks me and wants me to try to explain that. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so um, the, I'm going to do a, a really tiny caveat on that. Um, if there are bonds issued by any of the taxing jurisdictions, and in the interstate urban renewal area, it does impact bonds that were issued, there may be very slight increases to property tax bills because of those bonds. And it's not just for property within the urban renewal area. It, again, it's for every property within the city of Portland. The impacts are very slight, but I can't say there aren't impacts because there are slight impacts. The second question is, TIF, a primary driver of development in the city. I tried to find out exactly what people were wanting as um, what that question was getting to. The primary driver of development, uh, what, what I'm saying is it depends on how your TIF is used. And because I work all over the state, TIF is used in different ways in every community. Every community uses it differently. If you only have 15% of your total property in urban renewal, it impacts that 15% of the city. So if you're saying primary driver of development in the entire city, you have to keep that in context of where are you using urban renewal and how much is, is being used. So. I think people write their whole dissertations on this issue, so uh, knowing more precise questions later and if I can answer those, I can try to help, but I think just taking that in context of the amount of TIF uh, as being 15% helps put it into some context. Can Prosper Portland or the Portland Housing Bureau condemn property or make people sell property? And the answer is no. When urban renewal started in um, all, all across Oregon, urban renewal agencies did have the power for condemnation of private property. A number of years ago, by initiative, the voters in Oregon made it illegal for um, the taking of your property and selling it to you. They can still take property for public purpose, so if they need it for right-of-way or for utility expansion for public purposes, but they can't take private property away from someone in order to cause new development. Um, they used to be able to, they can't anymore. Next slide. So, sure. Absolutely, Dr. Ben. So I, I was hoping to reframe the first question because I, I'm not sure that this is exact, I understand the answer that you've given, but I don't think this is quite the question that people have been asking. I think the question that people are asking is a little bit more indirect. Yes, there's a property tax division, but if the purpose of a URA is revitalization and increased property values, how do those global effects of increased property values impact down to the individual property owners' assessed value and therefore taxes that they're paying? So that's a really good question and I think uh, again, that harkens back to the question of how are you using your TIF dollars. So in the interstate area, if you're allocating 70% of your TIF dollars towards affordable housing, and um, if you're looking at does that then impact the tax rates within the area, no, I would say not no. The, not the rates, the property value. So, so we know that the reason we're talking about an affordable housing crisis and a displacement crisis in right. the Northeast Portland right. is because of enormously increasing house prices, land prices and property prices. And I think the question is, as I'm sitting in a neighborhood and the prices are going up all around me, because I'm in this hot, gentrifying area, how is that the increased assessed value of my own property that I own affecting my property tax bill. Okay, <clears throat> so that's, that's a little di different question. 
So if, if I own property in the city of Portland and I don't sell that property and I don't do major rehabilitation on that property, my property taxes may only go up by a maximum of 3% per year. And that's because of the property tax limitation measures that voters passed, measures 5, 47, and 50. So as long as I stay in my property, and, and my property's assessed value may be at 250000 and the house next door sells, they, they uh, tear it down, they put a whole new building in, it sells for 700000 because that's what's happening around the city, okay? My property taxes in my house, because I'm not moving, I'm not selling, I'm not doing major rehabilitation, will not go up to that level. It will only go up that limited amount of 3% per year. Does that answer that question? Next slide. So maximum indebtedness is the controlling factor for urban renewal in Oregon. It's not a time frame, so urban renewal isn't prescribed by it. It has to be a 30-year urban renewal area or a 20-year urban renewal area. It's constrained by maximum indebtedness. So I'm going to cover a couple of things about maximum indebtedness because that's the thing you're thinking about doing. I'm going to cover how is it established, how increases can be done, and what is revenue sharing. So next slide. So maximum indebtedness is the legal limit of investment in an urban renewal area. It's the amount of money that can be sent on, spent on projects, programs, and administration of an urban renewal area. The maximum indebtedness of the interstate urban renewal area is $335 million. It is the controlling factor other than geography. The geography of an urban renewal area, the boundary, controls where you can spend that money. That money has to be spent within the urban renewal area. That maximum indebtedness amount can only in be, be increased through what's called a substantial amendment. A substantial amendment is defined in the state statute, as is a lot of what you may or may not do in an urban renewal area. It's prescribed in the statute. And it says that if you want to increase your maximum indebtedness, you have to go through the same process as originally adopting an urban renewal plan. And it lays out precisely what has to be in those documents and how you have to go about doing it. Next slide. So once you have an existing urban renewal plan like the interstate urban renewal plan, um, it may not be increased in size by more than 20% of the original urban renewal area. And that's a hard and fast rule, and I get asked a lot of times, well, what if we take some property out? Can we then use that as the cushion to add more property? And we've had legal opinions that say no. It, it's not fungible. You can't take property out and then backfill that back in. It's 20% of the original area. And you may not increase in um, large metropolitan areas, so the statute differentiates between smaller cities and the large cities. In large areas, you may not increase your maximum indebtedness by more than 20% of your original maximum indebtedness. So the total amount that you can ever increase the maximum indebtedness for the interstate area is $67 million. Next slide. In 2009, there were some changes to the statute that governs urban renewal, and part of those changes were initiating revenue sharing with the different taxing districts. And this happened because some of the taxing districts felt that if urban renewal areas were really successful, that they shouldn't have to wait until those urban renewal areas closed before they received some of the benefit of the success of those urban renewal areas. The statute was rewritten to say that any new urban renewal plans had specific targets where that revenue sharing had to begin, and existing urban renewal plans like the interstate plan had to hit those targets only if they did a substantial amendment to increase their maximum indebtedness. So if the interstate area does a substantial amendment to increase the maximum indebtedness, those revenue targets, revenue sharing targets, would go into effect. And 
uh, and I have another slide on that in just a minute, but the other thing that will happen is uh, at the bottom on this chart, you can see that if the area terminates with the existing maximum indebtedness, it is projected to terminate in fiscal year 2022-23, and the taxes would go back to all of the other taxing districts the next year, fiscal year 2023-24. If it was extended to that full 67 million, and you don't have to do the full 67 million, but that's the maximum you may do, that would extend it by three years. So it would terminate in fiscal year 2025-26, uh, and taxes would go back to the taxing jurisdictions that following year, fiscal year 2026-27. Next slide. Revenue sharing is extremely complicated, uh, as written in the statute. But the, the thing really to understand is when tax increment revenues equal 3% of the maximum indebtedness, 25% of any future growth in those monies that come in, those TIF monies, have to be shared with the taxing jurisdictions. When they reach 10%, then everything above that 10% goes to the taxing jurisdictions. So this would go into effect if the area was amended. The other taxing jurisdictions would start seeing some money. But the prior slide, the estimates of those three years take into account the fact that revenue sharing would kick in. So it's just for you to know that that does happen. It's, it's part of what the statute requires. But the impact would be that potential three-year impact. Next slide. This is the process of a substantial amendment. So the statute specifically says what has to happen to do a substantial amendment and the steps that you have to go through. So that's a little hard to read, but it starts with public input. Um, so the statute does require that you get public input. You prepare an amendment and a report on the amendment. Those are both prescribe exactly what has to be in those. They go first to Prosper Portland for their review. That's the way the statute lays out how to amend an urban renewal plan. Prosper Portland then looks at it and says, yes, this looks good. Let's send it out uh, to the, what's in the statute is called Planning Bureau, but yours is called the Planning and Sustainability Commission. And they review the amendment for its conformance to the comprehensive plan. And I've taken um, uh, substantial amendments through Portland through this process. And let me tell you, they don't specifically limit their review to that. A lot of other planning bureaus in the state do. Um, historically, the Planning and Sustainability Commission likes to be involved in other issues too. So they like to kind of put their stamp on the amendment also. Multnomah County gets to have a briefing. They don't get a vote on the amendment. Um, if you decided you wanted to increase the maximum indebtedness, if the, if the whole process over that 67 million, there is a procedure for doing that, which is called concurrence. And that means taxing districts who levy 75% of the permanent rate levy also have to vote their approval. So if you do it just to the 67 million, the only people who vote is the Portland City Council. If you do it above that amount, they get the other taxing districts like the county get a vote. In this case, if you do it under that 67, so that threshold is important, under th that 67 million, you have to give a briefing to the county, but they don't get to vote yes or no on it. And then the final determination um, on that increase is made by the Portland City Council, and it's made after a hearing that is noticed, it's called a super notice. So it's noticed to every household in the city through, there are four different ways you can do it. You can do it through utility bills, you can do it through voter registration, you can do it through property taxpayers. There may be only three. <laughs> um, through through the, those prescribed groups. So you have to let people know this is going to happen. You have to tell them that there's a potential for a maximum indebtedness increase. The city has to hold a public hearing and take input and then vote on a non-emergency ordinance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great information. Don't leave yet. Uh, we're going to give about five minutes for the joint committee's questions. Jillian. 
I thank you um, very much for that detailed review. I wanted to just hop back to um, Dr. Bates' question from earlier with just a point of clarification, and that is that the while currently property taxes can't go up by more than 3% a year, that measure 47 and 50 was passed in 1996, long after urban renewal was being used. And so historically, um, the memory, I think, in our community is that property taxes became such, within urban renewal areas, became so burdensome that people, it was a, um, a tool of displacement. So while that is not happening now, I just, I wanna go back and say that, that historically that that absolutely did happen. Yes. Um, and that I think that the, while well, the question itself that was posed is about um, taxes on personal property, we have to look at that it's not just about property taxes, it's also about increasing when those property values around you are increasing, the cost of maintaining your home goes up, the cost of your small business in a gentrifying area, your rent goes up because property values are going up because your landlord has more cost. And so it's, you know, it's, it, the question itself I think was very narrow, but I think that the answer is a little bit bigger when we're talking about TIF um, and how, um, how we can now use TIF to try and address some of the affordable housing issues, but that it's, I think it's really important to look back at the history of how it's been used to displace people and in a, um, under the guise of improving a neighborhood. So that's, that's all I wanted to add. Questions, comments, anyone else? Um, I just have a question. Um, in the ICRAC, um, we made a conscious decision that we did not want to have um, any condemnation. And so even with the public benefits, if it wasn't within the right of way, there's no um, opportunity for, for condemnation. So um, is that the same as the, the new law that went into effect, which was for basically per private pr property if they wanted to develop it or right. do something right. else. And there are other urban renewal areas across the state have, that ha have done the same thing, and they've said no condemnation will be used within this urban renewal area. So I, I don't remember I mean, that must be written. If, if that's so, it's usually written within the plan, and, and Gina talked really very specifically that the plan lays out what you may and may not do. Exactly. Alicia. Hi. Hi. The CDI Oversight Committee have been struggling with understanding the boundary. Um, and how it was, how the boundary was created in the first place. And so I don't know if you could speak to that or if that's a separate issue. I, I wasn't involved in the original boundary, so that's not really an issue I know the answer so to. It, it has nothing to do, since everyone is taxed based on their property values, it has not, or, or property taxes, it has nothing to do with the homes specifically based on the property taxes they're paying. I don't believe the boundary was made based on that. But the way, let, let me take a step back, because when you establish your maximum indebtedness originally in an urban renewal area, it's based on the value on which that 3% growth that we all pay the value of that plus projections of potential new development within the urban renewal area. So whenever I do a new urban renewal plan, the boundary and the maximum indebtedness go hand in hand because you establish your maximum indebtedness based on an assessed value within an area. And then I'm going to do this very quickly so it's not, not to get in trouble here. but. Um, so the first step an assessor does in giving that money to the urban renewal area is assess what that growth is within the urban renewal area, but then the assessor has to divide that among every property taxpayer in the city. 
of Portland. So it's doing, giving money to an urban renewal agency or to the Portland Housing Bureau or Prosper Portland is a two-step process. So it's looking at that original boundary, figuring out that growth and what the taxes off that is, and then dividing that amount of money that needs to be raised over every property tax bill in the city. Thank you very much. Shanisha, very rapidly, please. Thanks. My, my, <clears throat> my question is kind of connected to Lisa's uh, question as well. There has been major areas that have been redefined and moved out and, and, <clears throat> and areas that are no longer able to access, have access, because they were moved out in, I think, 2003. And so that means there was a boundary change, which means there will be no uh, accessible funding for people who are no longer in that area. That was, I think, I said in 2003. We're now to 15 years later. Do you think ever there will be a time when people who have no accessible <clears throat> funding or are no longer in the area where there's fund distribution, will that be a possibility through awareness campaign with the community? Because I don't think they even know to have to redefine fund distributions. So um, one of the slides talked about the limitation of how much additional acreage you can add to an urban renewal area. So you can never add more than 20% of the original acreage. So if you took property out and you want to put it back in to this area, you could put it back in, but it's going to count against that 20%. So as long as you had room in that 20%, um, you could put it back in. Some really crafty attorney may look at that and say, well, if it was in before it counts, I'm not an attorney and I've never had that question come up, so I don't know exactly, you know, if it was in this area before and you wanted to put it back in, which is what I think you're saying, I'm not sure how that would deal with that 20%. The most conservative way to look at it would be to say, has to meet that 20% limitation. If, if it falls within that, you could put it back in if you wanted to. You could, or the community. It's not on the city, city council basis. is the only one who gets to actually make those formal changes. The community could request it, but it's the city council who has the authority by statute to make those changes. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank mm -hmm. you for the. Uh, information in the report. Very thorough. Tori, you are up, sir, with the potential amendment, economic development impact. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Elaine. Appreciate it. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Tori Campbell, and I'm the manager of Prosper Portland. I manage our entrepreneurship and community economic development initiatives throughout the city. Uh, and I'm going to take a few minutes to walk with you through the continuation of the conversation that Elaine began to lay out of uh, what are the, the economic impacts if we do increase the maximum indebtedness. Um, for us, uh, the way the, the dollars are now uh, divided, the Portland Housing Bureau within the interstate uh, renewal area, they receive 70 percent of the urban renewal dollars, and we, Prosper Portland, uh, receive 30 percent. And so those are the funds that we would then use to create and further economic um, opportunities and impact. I think it's important to note before I move forward, when we're talking about uh, just a few kind of distinctions, I think all of us recognize that the goal of this um, work can and should be around wealth creation. Uh, and wealth creation happens in a variety of different ways. Historically in our country, wealth creation was through uh, the ownership of a home. And so I think that's why affordable housing and other things tend to show up um, as an important priority, whether that be down payment assistance or the, the repair of a home, because that allows those, that property to retain its value and stay within the family. Uh, so wealth creation also can come through uh, small business ownership or the development of property as well. And so as we're moving forward, I think you're going to hear from me and also from the Portland Housing Bureau what would be some of the, the opportunities that would come with increasing maximum indebtedness. Uh, I realize that when you say the city, you don't make distinctions sometimes between the Portland Housing Bureau or Prosper Portland, like it's just the city, and I need them to hear me. But it is important to understand our unique functions uh, with respects to how we utilize these dollars. For us, when we think about economic impact, 
uh, Prosper Cortland, we use these dollars uh, primarily uh, through the support of business ownership and support of long-term property owners through development. Uh, and the Portland Housing Bureau obviously has an initiative around housing matters. Um, and we have within our action plan that many of you that are on the oversight committee um, are working with us on, we did uh, take a portion of our dollars um, at the behest of the community and we, uh, we pushed it over to the Portland Housing Bureau to help with some housing needs, particularly with individuals that um, made more than 80% of the MFI or the median family income. And so the dollars that we gave to the Portland Housing Bureau, $5 million, uh, was to be given towards individuals who made between 80% and I believe 120% of the MFI. And the reason why we did that is, as stated earlier, uh, when you think about Northeast, uh, even for folks that are making good money and are doing well for themselves, they still cannot afford to live here and they're getting priced out. And so uh, that was a, a, a really a response from the community who said, we recognize that Prosper Portland, your primary use of your dollars is around helping small business and property development, but can you use some funding strategically to ensure that individuals who still want to call North Northeast Portland home but make more than 80 percent can use those dollars. So I just wanted to level set that before we move forward. I'll take a few minutes just to say what would be the economic impact in terms of increasing uh, the maximum indebtedness. Uh, for us, if it's 67 million, that means we receive 30% of that, which is roughly 18 million. And those would be non-set aside dollars that are currently not earmarked for anything. So it, in, in essence, it is new, new money that we uh, can then begin to consider how do we utilize those dollars. Um, what I will say is, because it's not really sure at this point, we've not determined how we use those dollars, um, but they definitely will need to be in alignment with the existing action plan. Uh, but how those dollars are utilized, what buckets they go into, that is yet to be determined. Uh, increasing the maximum indebtedness, it allows us for sure to be able to reevaluate the existing action plan in terms of its allocations, such as the different programs and ways in which we have already earmarked through a community-driven process, such as our PIP grant, which is our property investment program, or our community livability grants, which go towards supporting nonprofits who serve uh, those that, are, that live in within this community, or even such things as a cultural business hub, um, which we have discussed and we're talking about. I think the last thing I'll say is if we do increase the maximum indebtedness, which would allow us to have an additional $18 million to work with, it allows for a more like robust conversation uh, in, with respects to a topic that's come up over and over and over again from the jump, which is if you're saying wealth creation is the, the major thrust of this initiative, and, but yet the pri one of the primary ways in which dollars are being dispersed is through loans, uh, that's, it almost feels counterintuitive. If you're saddling folks who historically have been left out and underserved and you're wanting to help to accelerate their growth, why straddle them with loans? And so we would then be able to revisit that conversation more robustly of can we change the ratio of loans to grants that we currently have structured. Uh, the next piece is I just want to briefly show you, and I believe those in the audience have this visually to look at. This is just the current uh, action plan, the way in which the dollars are currently allocated. Um, Alicia already expressed the, the, the five different buckets that go towards uh, property, um, promoting property ownership and redevelopment. There's 10 um, point seven million there. Uh, there's 9.2 million that goes towards support of business ownership and growth. Uh, Five million, as I mentioned, uh, is towards the investment of new and existing homes, and those dollars are uh, being administered through the Portland Housing Bureau and through their process of how they administer those funds. Um, and then there's 2.5 that goes towards advancing our community livability project, which again is funding that helps support nonprofits that serve communities here in the North Northeast area. And then lastly, the 4.5 million that we currently have that can be invested into a cultural business hub, uh, formerly called an anchor or a signature product. And the, the idea of a cultural business hub is trying to create synergy uh, through creating like placemaking, a place where it's noted that it, that's uh, a place where you can go and you can see a cluster of uh, African-American owned businesses and, and, and it also creates opportunity for cultural dynamics and uh, just a, a place where we can say this is for us um, and it supports us and there's uh, continuing ongoing wealth creation opportunities. So those are just the five buckets that we are currently working in within the action plan as we have our first uh, set of dollars which is a 32 million. Um, the one thing we did do on the next slide is 
just for sake of uh, for tonight uh, to give something to, re to perhaps react to, um, we did say if based on current levels, if we just did it breaking out the percentage of how our dollars of the 32 million are currently allocated, what would it look like to get an additional 18? We just did it based on the current percentages. It would show an increase in each of those areas that would correspond to the way in which the dollars are currently situated. Um, but I do want to remind you again that we've not come to any conclusion on that. This is a process I actually want to go through with our oversight committee and really talk through, like, how's the best way to approach this? Is this something that uh, we want to just provide recommendation and oversight committee? We, we have a conversation around it. Is it something that we feel like we need to bring back out to the community? Um, but there are a variety of ways that we can and should move forward in terms of understanding if we receive this additional 18 million how we should best use it. But this is just to give a reaction uh, to see what the numbers would look like in terms of increasing uh, really the opportunities to do more, potentially more good in terms of wealth creation opportunities over the life of the urban renewal, urban renewal area in particular with our action plan. Um, I think the final couple of slides uh, really just wanted to share with you. We've been at our action plan for about a year and a half now and some of the early results of uh, funding that has actually gone out and really done what we hoped it would do shows some of that. So we would say with property owners, so far we have given out um, grants, particularly through our uh, PIP program or our Prosperity Investment Program, which um, we have, I would say, I think the report says roughly around $5 million has gone out so far of the 32 million. And, and about three million of that has gone primarily through our prosperity investment program or our PIP program, which is designed to, it's a grant program. It's a, you, up to $75,000. It's a matching grant, so there is some dollars that have to be put into it. So up to 75, which means the property owner or the business who is applying for it would have to put 25,000 25, down. Um, but it can be used for uh, facade improvements or tenant improvements within inside of a building. And so far, we've actually seen that program uh, do really, really well, uh, where 26 uh, property owners have used, utilized that, 17 business owners have utilized that program. Uh, we've also seen within our community livability grant, of our total goal, we've seen 17, um, uh, 15, excuse me, uh, community nonprofits that serve the community receive grants. And also within the Portland Housing Bureau, the dollars that we allocated, that $5 million, so far about 14 homeowners have benefited from that. And so the total we've seen to date, um, just to give you uh, some perspective, is around $5 million has gone out. Uh, now when we do a look back, because you know, obviously for us, we're hungry for more. We want to see these dollars get out the door. And the Oversight Committee has expressed that, that really we need to continue to move with a sense of urgency. Historically, we have seen that typically in a given year, uh, that typically between one to two million dollars historically has gone out. And so we've actually seen five million go out in one year. And so that has, actually says that that's a, sig a significant jump. Um, is it enough? No, but we should also recognize that there is momentum that way. And I think probably the other unique thing I'll say about the five million that's gone out is typically with um, the TIF dollars that we have seen, they typically either go to large projects or to infrastructure. And so you see large chunks of money that go out but tend to only benefit one or two individuals or a developer or infrastructure as a whole. In this case, the, the vast majority of the five million or three million that has gone out through the PIP program, it's actually individual small businesses or properties. And that, that was a real big concern for the community, even with the cultural business hub, as they recognize it could be a real good benefit to the community, but they feel like maybe only one or two people would benefit from a project like that. They would love to see the money dispersed out more generously to a variety of people. And so we can already see within the first year, we don't know if this will be a continuing trend, we want it to be, that three million has gone out and it definitely has helped out smaller portions. That's, just, that's actually harder work, I guess is what I'm saying, but work that's nonetheless being done. Um, and I think one more slide and I'll be done in terms of uh, what I have to share, and if there are any questions, I'm glad to take them. Um, I think it's important to note, too, you know, you just can't just ask for money and, and not have a vision or plan for it. And I think for us, there are still parts of the action plan that, although there are good things happening, there's still some areas that we're not seeing the kind of traction that we want. And so for us, there is, again, fresh urgency to really be able to say the plan was created with community involvement. It, it had some, some real clear concepts attached to it, but honestly there was also some assumptions that are driving it 
And for us, it's important to uh, do everything we can to ensure that people are aware of the programs, that they're accessing the programs, that we are removing barriers, but also for us to learn is, is what we initially thought <laughs> really actually what's out there. Does the, is the market there to bear that? Are there individuals or their property owners that are wanting to develop their properties? And are, are our tools what they need and how can we readjust them? So I think that's something to be um, mindful of. So community outreach is something that we want to increase. We also want to support large scale real estate and development projects. That's one key area. And then we also wanted to explore geographic amendments to the urban renewal area. Others, there's other potential properties that could be brought in that could take advantage of TIF dollars in our action plan. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Questions from the Oversight Committee? Always. I think I misunderstood um, what you We don't hear you. OK. Uh, I think I misunderstood. Um, on the slide where you're talking about the economic impact mm -hmm. outcomes to date. Um, so 26 of 44, uh, that's with the current funding. Mm -hmm. And it's over what period of time? Just over the last year and a half. OK, thank you. And also one thing I'll say is of those who received within our PIP program, which was the largest uh, amount of dollars funded, 49 grants, 92% um, of those recipients were people of color. And the second number is pipeline? Mm -hmm. okay. Five years. Over, over five years. Over five years. Yeah, so we're saying 26 property owners to date have received funding. Over the five years, we wanted to see 44, according to our action plan, receive okay. that funding. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Leisha. Hi, Tori. Hey. Can you speak a little to the changing pipeline numbers and, how they're, and why they're changing? in terms of decreasing, increasing? Um, I would say that I think that's still yet to, to be understood. I feel like the energy that was put behind the, the community engagement and involvement building up to the action plan, I think that conversation and a lot of the engagement that we saw within the community made folks be, become more aware that there's new opportunities. Um, we have done some community outreach. We have uh, done different communication strategies. We have navigators that are participating and trying to help people become more aware. Um, and honestly, some of this, as you know, is word of mouth. I think many individuals um, have gotten, been, have benefited from the program and they're telling others, like, this is a good look, you should try it. So I think those are some of the ways that we're currently measuring uh, the success of what we see in terms of pipeline. Thank you. So then the, the original goal number, why is that one also changing? So 44, 55, what? What has impacted those changes? Those numbers haven't changed. Meaning like property owners seeing 20 to 44, mm -hmm. those numbers should be what we see from the original action plan. Okay. If they change, do you know what, if they have changed, do you know what might have led to that? If they have, if they would change, there would have to be a discussion as to why that is the case. Like, do we feel like it's important we're seeing success or we feel like dollars should be, uh, be aligned here, therefore we should increase the possible opportunities. So but that should be a conversation. So it's not because money has changed or allocation has changed of dollars that those goals have changed. So for example, in this original one, it looks like 40 mm -hmm. property owners and here it's 44. Okay. So I'm just wondering if we know why those are changing. It shouldn't change. That could be a typo of some sort, but those numbers should not change with respects to the original action plan. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tori. We yeah. appreciate that. Thank you for the presentation at this point. We are going to talk about the potential amendment for affordable housing. So if there is an amendment, how does that impact economic development, which we just heard, and then how can it impact affordable housing? Leslie Goodlove. Okay. Uh I don't have my glasses on, I can't see that. Um, <laughs> so good evening, Leslie Goodlow. I'm the Business Operations Manager for the Portland Housing Bureau and I'm one of the project sponsors for the North Northeast Housing Strategy. And so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, housing set aside in the ICURA, what we've been able to accomplish um, as far as housing goes, and then what our proposal is for how we would spend the 45, 40, whatever number, 47, that we would get if we maximize the indebtedness. 
Okay, slide, because this isn't working. Um, so um, I'm gonna, first, the first slide is, and these slides are in the order of the goals that uh, we set through the strategy. And so the first goal was um, preventing displacement. And so in the interstate URA, we have um, given 420 home repair loans over the time of uh, the year 2000 to 2018. And you can see, well, those of you that have the packet, because I can't read that off the slide, the AMI for folks, and a majority of those people were below 50% AMI. Thank you so much. And 37% of them were people of color. Next slide. Home repair grants. Um, the time frame for these are a little slightly different. We've got done 282 between July of 2013 and June of 2018, and 65% of um, those grants were to people of color. Next slide. 668 people were able to purchase homes in the URA between 2000 and 2018. 42% of them were people of color, and um, you can see the AMI on there. And then since we started the strategy, which everybody probably knows, we, haven't, we have not achieved a great deal of home ownership, but the six people that have purchased through the strategy are people of color. And then as um, Dr. Holt spoke to earlier, if you wanna to go to the next slide, which you cannot see that map at all, but we have 1,500 regulated units within the URA. Um, that have been created and um, have some TIF dollars associated with them. All of those are not related to the strategy, but it's just to talk about what we've been able to do within the URA. Next slide. So we currently have um, 503 units in the pipeline under the strategy. And you can see the projects that are listed in the total dollar amount. Uh, there's one project that um, we are still working with the mayor on the gap funding that our oversight committee uh, recommended that we spend um, at our last meeting. But if all of those units come to fruition, that will give us over 2,000 units in the URA that have been funded by uh, some form of set aside. And 80% of those units of that 503 will be uh, utilizing the preference policy. The other 20% will uh, primarily have project-based Section 8 vouchers, and there's a se separate preference for those. And so 80% um, will use the policy. Next slide. We have uh, approximately 106 units in, um, of home ownership in development for approximately $11 million. And in addition, we have um, money for down payment assistance that is on top of this for another uh, 22, 30, 31 families. And um, all of these uh, units will be um, purchased through the preference policy. Additionally, at our oversight committee and through the Housing Bureau, we are seeking to uh, make the down payment assistance forgivable. So at year 15, 50% of the down payment would, would be forgiven, and then 3% per year up to year 30, and it would be totally forgiven. So if someone was to sell their house after 15 years, they would be required to pay back 50%. If they stayed in the house for 30 years, it would be totally forgiven and would not have to uh, repay any of the down payment. Next slide. So I ran through these pretty quick, but um, at our June Oversight Committee meeting, our Oversight Committee uh, approved the recommendation for us to use a portion of our remaining set aside, which is approximately 16, 16 17 million dollars uh, for land baking. And we are in 
um, process of purchasing two pieces of land. Additionally, we have money that has been set aside to fill gaps. One of the projects that I mentioned earlier, the Argyle, has um, that recommendation has not yet been approved by the mayor, but we're hoping to get that in front of him within the next couple of weeks so that we can add that um, project as a definite on um, our list. So the um, increased set aside, we have four significant projects that we would like to um, propose to our oversight committee to finish out the district. The first one would be a home ownership development of approximately 50 to 70 units on one of the pieces of property that we are in process of purchasing. The second project would be um, a rental development of uh, between 45 and 50 units. The third project would be uh, developing the other piece of property that we're currently trying to purchase and there's not been a determination whether that would be uh, home ownership or rental. And so part of the discussion with our oversight committee will be for us to talk about what would be the best use for that piece of property. And um, we would like to spend between 15 and 22 million on that uh, development, depending upon if we do home ownership or rental. And then the final project, with, with, which we're uh, calling future project would just be um, whatever if something else was to come up we would set aside um, seven and a half million dollars to do an additional uh, rental project and um, I just wanted to give you a little more information about where we've how we've been doing with the preference policy because that is how all of these projects will be leased or the the home ownership units uh, purchased so far, 98% um, of the home ownership um, applicants were people of color, and 63% of them were black. For rental, 85% of the people that applied were uh, people of color, and 49% of them were uh, black. And so a couple things that have come up, questions why people, people have asked, why is it, how is this any different? than before when um, we started the URA, why, why should people um, vote for this? Why should you recommend this? And I can say that one of the major differences between when this URA started and now is you, is these two groups sitting here at these tables telling uh, Prosper uh, and PHB that we're moving in the wrong direction or approving things, recommending things, so that you ensure that we do what we said we were gonna do, and that the people that have been most greatly impacted are the ones that have first opportunity for these dollars. And so I think that's the major difference is um, oversight committees like yourself that are keeping us um, uh, straight, keeping us honest, I'll put it that way. And so, um, I think that is the end of my presentation, and I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Questions? Jennifer. I was just wondering if you could clarify something. When you had mentioned approval by the Oversight Committee for, um, I think, one of the projects that was listed up there, do you, are you referring to both Oversight Committees? Because we have an interesting um, scenario where there are two Oversight Committees um, overseeing the TIF funding for one URA, uh, yeah. So the answer would be our housing oversight committee would, we would take them a recommendation and then they would vote on it for whether or not they would support that recommendation and then we would take that to the mayor as he's the housing commissioner and say, hey, our oversight committee supported this recommendation and generally he um, agrees with that so that it would be our housing oversight committee. When? Thank you for your presentation. I was looking forward to it so that I can, can gain you pull a your mic? deeper understanding. Just pull it directly. Thank you, Leslie. You stated finish out the district. What does that mean? It means just whatever the remaining dollars are. So currently, like I said, we have about 16 million left. 
if we if we're, the URA is not um, extended, then our dollars would be done basically because the if we um, do fill the gap for the Argyle, we purchase these couple pieces of property um, that will pretty much end um, finalize the dollars that we have unallocated. We still have dollars sitting allocated that have not been spent. For example, we have somewhere between five and seven million that we've allocated to home repair that we've yet to spend. So that's one of the reasons why we did not, we're not proposing to add additional dollars to home repair because we have a lot of money um, available for home repair. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you very much. We may call you back. All right. This moment, we're going to open it up to our community. Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for uh, participating in the process. Again, we are talking about a significant item around the URA, the maximum indebtedness, and the impacts and concerns around that. So uh, if you did not get a chance to fill one of these out and you want to uh, speak, we'd love to have you do that. Um, at this point, I've got four, and so the first person I'm going to call is Bird, if you'd come up and join us. You don't want to go first, Bird? You don't want to go first? Okay. Well, it's because you're so loved. If you want to, you can bring it up. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of my original statements I'm not going to make because they've been covered. Alicia, I would like to answer your question about the creation of the Interstate Urban Renewal Area because I don't believe it was answered. The Interstate Urban Renewal Area was not a result of community desires. It was a result of not having adequate funding for transportation infrastructure. And so there were several votes. Uh, voters did not approve for the funding. And so it left local government agencies seeking money, hence the creation of the Interstate Urban Renewal Area, because you could use urban renewal dollars to do that. So that's how the creation of the Interstate Urban Renewal Area got started. I think speakers today did an excellent job covering a lot of stuff of what I wanted to cover. I wanted to talk about how urban renewal in general, and we can all point to what is it, four very specific things that get talked about ad nauseum, and how they've impacted Portland's black community. Memorial Coliseum, what are they? I-5, somebody help me out. Lloyd Center and Emanuel Hospital, right? Okay, so the interstate urban renewal area is unique in a lot of ways. It's the largest urban renewal area in Portland. Not only that, it's the, it's the uh, how can I say this? It's the main or the only, in a lot of regards, urban area to include residential areas, residential areas that were occupied by non-white people. And so we can all agree that gentrification is a byproduct, if not a goal, of urban renewal. So this is my question. We've already been shot four times by urban renewal by the same person. We are being asked to allow that person, the same person, to use the same gun to shoot us again. If Prophet Portland was serious about these efforts, why aren't we hearing an alternative? Yes, if you want to introduce the interstate corridor, that's how come there isn't an alternative? If, you're really, if you really understand the history and the damage that was done, you are asking a people to allow the same tool that harmed you to repair you. I don't know that any other people would be having this conversation. I'm done. Oh, Alicia, I have the original document here from when the URA was started. And I also have a report on gentrification in the urban renewal area. Interstate. Can I, can I ask a question? Oh, now you asking me questions? Well, because, <laughs> no, it was my original question. OK. And it was about the boundary. Did sure. you know how oh, yeah. houses are in or out of the boundary? So what we do know is. Got about a minute. 
I have a minute. Mm -hmm. What we do know is uh, the interstate urban renewal area is very gerrymandered, and, and the boundaries do not align with the boundaries of Albina. So I don't know if that answers your question. Because, oh, this is what happened. So 10 neighborhood associations were asked to submit portions of their neighborhood to include in the boundary, which is why it's so weird. So that's, that's what happened, too. Appreciate it. Thank I have 30 you. seconds, right? <laughs> I'm not done. <laughs> Thank you, Bert. Thank you very much. Fred Smith, you come. I didn't get a chance to say it, but you're going to have three minutes. Only get three minutes and I was living there all my life? Wow. Uh, well, Fred, we couldn't let you go forever tonight. Well, I'm just bothered with some of the things that are going on because when we talk about bringing people back to the Northeast and North Portland, we're talking about me. I was born in Portland. I was raised right down on Benton where the new uh, educational board is at. And I've been pushed around here, pushed around there. And what I understand now is that I'm in this program called PCRI, and it seems like they're being marginalized, or financially oppressed, because, I'm saying that because there's other programs that are getting more financing than them. And I would like to know why that's going on. Why are other programs getting $125,000 and PCR clients only getting 120, I mean 100. What's going on? I mean, birds with feather flock together, right? And no matter whether you're black, white, checkerboard, or zebra stripe, you all got to live so many years and you all shared the same tears. What's going on? It's a great question. It's a great question. And Fred, I, I as opposed to getting to all the specifics, we will definitely get back and answer that question because it's nuanced within programmatic dollars. It's not just a matter of uh, simple allocation. It has to do with uh, notice of funding availability, has to do with RFP, it has to do with how dollars were allocated originally. So based on programming, which I won't get into tonight, the allocation was associated with that, which was spelled out in the original allocations. So. Hmm. I know when you put everything together, all this money coming from one pot, right? When you put it all together, so why isn't it being distributed equally? So uh, let me I'm just done. say this, and, and we'll wrap it up, but I do want to have that conversation. So some things are for permanent affordability, and some things are not for permanent affordability. So, but that's a conversation that I don't want to get into tonight, but we'll definitely get back to you, and I'd love to have the conversation. Okay. Thank you. Permanent affordability means that properties will be kept in affordable uh, opportunity perpetually. So certain dollars are allocated to make sure that properties remain affordable. So a family that purchases it purchases through a program, if they move out, then that house has a buy down agreement so that it remains affordable for the next family to purchase it. And so the allocations were associated with that. So. Hopefully that made sense. Yes. May I just note that that conversation has happened in the housing oversight committee space. It, in my view, remains unclear and, and adequately explained to the community and to the oversight committee. It is a complicated issue, but I think it is an outstanding question that needs to be explained much more clearly um, this might not be the meaning to do that, but it needs to be answered in a way that can be clearly understood by everyone. Absolutely, which is why I said we will get back to that. It's a great question and something to be addressed. Quentin Blanton. And you, Quentin, will have three minutes. Good to see you tonight. Hi. Uh, my name is Quentin, and I'm just a concerned community member 
that wanted to talk more about uh, you guys' issues. So one of the things that I've noticed is that this program isn't specific enough. It, if this program was to be serious, I think that it should be centered on lineage. And um, you guys use a lot of terms and, different th and say different things that allow um, you know, everybody to eat off of the failure of a specific group. Um, you use terms like underserved communities, you use people of color, but the, the racist targeting of urban renewal was a specific uh, black American failure. And then I was looking at the interstate corridor um, allocations of funds and you know, there's no kind of recognition that everybody is not situated the same economically. So, and, and you know, it was like even they had, um, I was looking at how they had, the funds had been allocated and African Americans had gotten more, but it was like Asians had almost got just as much as African Americans and, and, and we're the only group that's experiencing in that area and on a national level, a downward disparity in uh, income as well as wealth. So it was just, it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me and um, you know, and many other projects you guys are proposing, like the Broadway corridor and the interstate urban renewal area, those are based on specific Black American failures. So I mean, I just want more. My at, and I spoke on this uh, at a couple of meetings ago, when I was at a, uh, one of the meetings, and nobody said anything. So I would just ask that you guys give a lineage-based breakdown on. Um, you know who's getting what and how you guys are allocating the funds because you guys aren't saying anything about that. And uh, yeah, so I would just like to know more about that uh, because otherwise we don't know exactly where, you know, my community and the people who were displaced from this area, which who were largely African American, there's no way to determine who's getting those funds and where those funds are going. So I would like to see more of an emphasis on lineage and more specificity around that. Yeah. Thank you, Quentin. Is it Renisha Harris? Yeah. Three minutes. Hi, I'm a current participant of this housing strategy program. I'm home ready. There were no ADA units, there were no four bedroom units, so I was strayed or strayed to Habitat because of the program can accommodate me. So I wanna know what are you guys doing to make sure that there's ADA units and single family dwellings for people with more than three bedrooms. So now I'm with Habitat because I didn't have to wait on a list or anything because PPA automatically shipped me to them. And I'm housing ready, and I still have yet to be in a home, and it's four years later. Well, thank you, Renisha. I appreciate that. I wish I'd heard from you before. Well, let's make sure we talk after today, after we're done. Thank you. Susan Running. Mm -hmm. Hi, Susan. You have three minutes. Thank you. I'm Susan Ronning. I live in the Kenton neighborhood. Uh, I understand that we're going to be talking about the Argyle project on the next meeting, but I did want to bring this up to your attention to think about. Um, I just want to, I'm part of the Neighborhood Association Board, so I'm not speaking on their behalf tonight, but um, personally, we, our, our neighborhood has put together a plan as to how we want our, our our town to be built and how we want to bring in people and bring in businesses and, and have uh, good housing for everyone. Um, the current plan with the Argyle project doesn't, initially it met the requirements of what we expected and what we wanted, but over the course of the design process, changes have happened and they've, they've modified the design so that the, um, there's a, a lesser number of units, it's not as as many units as, as was originally was planned. There's a few parking spaces. And then there's no commercial uh, space that we really wanted. We really, really wanted it to be mixed, um, mixed business use, so residential and commercial. And that's been taken away. And in order to meet the funding requirements, uh, they've also changed the, 
the structure of it so that the, they're not using, I forget what the name of it is. They're not paying prevailing wage, so they can, so they can not have to pay prevailing wage. So the builders are not going to, they're not going to be paid what they should be paid. So, so these are issues that we see. Um, so, you know, our neighborhood has put this plan together. We would hope that anything that's getting developed in that neighborhood actually meets what we, what we wanted. So there's been a team of people that have been working on this for years and years, and now, you know, they're coming in and just changing the rules. So, so we just want this, you know, to bring this up to you now so you can think about it. But we would like to have any, um, you know, as we put in projects to take advantage and, and of what's already been done in the neighborhoods as to how, what does the community, what does the community want? How, how do we want our neighborhood to be built so that it, might, you know, meets everyone's needs? And we definitely want housing. We want more people. Um, we want it to be affordable, but we also want it to meet, you know, what we want to build. And this project specifically is right on the corridor for Denver as you come into, into Portland, essentially. As you come down off of, um, into you know, off of Den on Denver and Interstate, where you see you know the big Paul Bunyan. So here's the entrance to Portland, and there's this project is going to be right across the street from that. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yvette Davis. I'm sorry. Yes. I'd just like to thank you for that comment and just say how it really speaks to kind of how we started this meeting today and that um, the oversight committees are responsible for seeing that the TIF financing really does actually revitalize neighborhoods and that um, they're held accountable to the intent in which they received the funding. So thank you very much for those comments. Um, and it would behoove us to make sure that the TIF funding and the projects being proposed don't get hijacked, um, you know, beyond the original intent. Thank you, Jennifer. Yvette, you've got three minutes. Thank you. Um, my question is more so for um, the Portland Housing Bureau and what you guys intend to do with the remaining pots of money. Um, you spoke on you have funds, five to seven million in home repairs. Why not increase the amount of money that you're giving to the homeowners that need those repairs rather than taking those funds away? Also, you want to buy property. Why not increase the amount of money that you're giving to people to purchase, as we know that the housing costs are rising, rather than buying some property just to sit on? Because if, if you don't get the money to um, be able to build on, that property will sit vacant, and it won't be of a service, rather than giving people the funds to be able to purchase and not have vacant lots. Uh, so the home repair dollars, um, we are actively um, working on getting those out the door. We have uh, modified the dollar amounts a couple of times in the six years I've been with the Housing Bureau from um, $15,000 and now it's up to $40,000 for loans and from $5,000 up to ten dollars or $15,000 for grants depending upon how we've allocated. So we have increased those um, dollar amounts for home repair loans. The uh, one of the pieces of property that we are looking to purchase is a um, property that's um, owned by a long term property owner. It's in the heart of the district. And that was one of the goals of the uh, strategy when we did our community forums was for us to purchase property from longtime property owners and then to develop it and hope to support um, other people of color, or specifically black people. And so that's one of the reasons why we're purchasing that piece of property if it comes to fruition. And then the other piece is to build um, exactly what you're saying, home ownership units that we can then sell at a, an affordable price. I guess I'm not speaking to the, the um, actual loans for the home repair, like the retention programs that the different agencies run. Um, with that rising cost of just doing repairs and just doing business, $15,000 doesn't do a lot. Um, and so I, I'm not saying like the grants, I'm, or the grants, I'm just talking about the dollars that were given for the retention services, not necessarily the loans that people can apply for. 
I'm not sure what your question is, dear. Well, I was just wondering why you don't increase that dollar amount. We're not talking about the grants. loans. No, we're not talking, you said loans. We're not talking about loans, like not increasing the loan amount, but the actual amount that you give per household to be able to do the repairs that they need on their houses. Right, so we, do, we have two programs. One is a grant program that will go up to $15,000 depending upon how that particular program is structured. And then we have a loan program for home repairs that goes up to $40,000. So we have two different programs. One, the loan program we manage through the Portland Housing Bureau, and then the grant programs are managed through our subrecipient contractors. And so we give them money and then they work with homeowners to determine what it is that they need done to their house. I guess I, sorry, um, just the 15,000 I'm seeing is not enough to be able to help the homeowners. And if we're trying to help them retain their properties, 15,000 is not, it's not even a drop in the bucket in some of the repairs that need to be done. Appreciate it. Sharon Maxwell. And if any of the conversations such as that need to continue, please do so offline. Sharon, you've got three minutes. Sure, thank you. Uh, good evening, thank you. This was really great. Um, I am a committee member from the Heal Legacy Project and I'm glad that we were able to get all of this information. Um, it'll really help us to determine how we need to proceed. And um, a couple of the people that have come up have actually uh, spoken to a couple of my questions um, in regards to getting a running breakdown of um, African Americans who have been serviced and helped by the dollars would, would really be helpful if we can get that online somewhere. And also um, in regards to the economic impact had some questions in regards to um, moving forward uh, those numbers as well. Um, I don't know if there's a way that there can be a cohort group that can be ongoing to meet the needs for business owners and property owners um, so that there can be some, I guess, feedback and peer coaching because uh, when we look at Alberta um, Street, Williams Avenue, Vancouver, and Mississippi, and we're hearing this information um, of how this, um, the urban renewal was supposed to help us as African Americans and you know, existing property owners and businesses for the majority haven't benefited from, from this. And so just really going forward, we really need to have something in place because it hasn't worked. And um, I just would like to see Prosper um, do even more to repair. So when you're making people whole, um, I think there's more intentional about how you do that, especially when people have been oppressed, uh, when they've been targeted, when you know, things haven't worked and in a dominant culture um, where you just always seem like you're fighting against systems, um, it's a cultural shift that we're also um, dealing with that needs to be addressed and not just the economics. So there's more than that. Those factors are all layered and I think we need to use the peer coaching and the cohort groups to really bring this together so that we can see more success and especially at a time when we have this momentum in the community when we are doing such great work and have come a lot further than where we've been. And I think too when the people um, are not as oppressed, then they have the ability to be innovative and creative and allow the ideas to come forth. And when there is freedom with inside, then they can express the things that they desire to do. So, thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Lisha. Yeah. So, I have expressed to Prosper Portland my desire to see numbers, data, information as well. Um, and I'm wondering with Quentin and yourself, if what the information you're seeking is just numbers, like how many African Americans have been helped, or do you have more specific information that you're looking to see um, in some kind of report form? Um, if you could be specific, maybe Prosper Portland is in the room, we can hear that, you can reinforce what I've asked for it myself, 
and we can come together and come up with exactly what we're asking for? Yeah, I think we, what we really need to see is what the help has been, what um, the steps that have been taken, what services they received, how actual much, um, whether it was technical assistance, uh, where they're at to date, um, what's worked, what hasn't worked, because that ongoing information can help the people coming behind them, as well as it can uh, paint the picture for the larger community because they don't believe us. They don't believe that um, people have been trying and putting their time and efforts in, and they don't get the support from the larger community and in patronage. Um, we see doors closing every day because um, even when people do open businesses, um, they're still marginalized because the dollars aren't being spent with them. So we need to make sure that we see best practices how to do the marketing, the branding. Um, you know, if you can see all these other businesses thriving and doing well, and then you see businesses of color, but specifically African American businesses still struggling and doors closing, then that's a problem. Thank you very much. Quentin, we can't hear you. You would need to come to the. In terms of the numbers you were saying, like how you guys wanted statistics and different, or you wanted us to be more specific about the statistics, what I was talking about wasn't based on race. I was talking about um, lineage and how the um, funds should be allocated, well, how I would like to see how they're being allocated to black Americans who lived in that neighborhood, specifically those who were displaced by the racist um, systematic displacement of those families. That's my ask. I don't want that group to be lumped in because, and I, I liked how when I looked at the interstate corridor, they even, uh, um, they didn't lump all black people together. They actually had a section that was for African immigrants and then they had um, African American. I, I would have liked to have, you know, so that's, that's, that's what I was talking about was lineage based um, statistics and different things like that. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Appreciate it. Comments, questions from any other members of the oversight committees? So to bring us back to point of meeting for tonight, it was around the URA specifically and how the URA has impacted and or can impact um, uh, the expansion of the URA can impact um, our economic opportunity and or housing uh, development. That is the consideration and what needs to be processed uh, in relationship to determinations, right, and recommendations. So uh, from the Oversight Committee, do you feel like you've got enough information to process um, what you've heard is sufficient for that? So I know we're not making a vote. I'm aware of that. I'm, I'm aware of the no votes. I'm asking the question is based on what, because no, some- we don't have enough information to make a, determ to make a recommendation. By no, I'm not asking us to make recommendations. If there are other questions for the group from the presenters that you would have for tonight, from those who presented, are there other questions? So I know we're not making a recommendation tonight. I'm asking, do we feel like you've been sufficiently informed? And if not, what other information would you need? Maybe that's a better stated question. Yes. So Maurice. I would say no. Um, what I would say is the community asks a lot of serious questions that I took to heart. And I think those questions need to be answered in order for us to be fully informed. I did like the, prese uh, the presentation, but I do think there's a lot of questions that still need to be answered. And I think a lot of them came up today with the community comments. Um, my concern is that we've always seen what are the positives. I want a synopsis of what can go wrong. And everyone comes forth with good intentions, but the after effect is what we have now. So what are the possibilities and what can go wrong if we decide to increase and expand? And that's what I would like to see. The up and the downside. Up and the downside. Thank you. Quinn. 
My question is along the same lines. I just keep hearing this word maximum and I just never hear anything outside of maximum. So I'm wondering, are there other alternatives and why is it that it just needs to be the maximum? Leisha. Um, so my answer is no to your question. Um, one of the questions that I have not been able to get answered tonight clearly, uh, first of all, let me just say I think the presentations were really well put together, but they were really high level. And there was not, um, uh, this, for me, um, hearing this for the first time, it was not broken down enough for me to clearly comprehend in order to make a decision about anything. Um, so my question ar around how the boundary was determined in the first place would lead me to my second question of, is that the same way the boundary would be determined if we increase the indebtedness? Is, is there a difference? So I'm just unclear on a lot of those issues. And maybe because it was so high level and people didn't have a lot of time to explain stuff that I'm, I miss. So my answer would be no. Again, this is not about being able to make a determination. This is not about a recommendation. The question I posed or reposed was, Based on the information that was presented, do you feel like you have enough understanding uh, related to URA, URA expansion, so forth, and what would be needed, what other information? Maurice said the questions that were posed, you'd like to get answers around those. Uh, Marlon, you mentioned that what, um, uh, what could go wrong, that what was presented is what could go right, and so forth. So we're not trying to get a recommendation, no, yeah, so. No, no, it's not about the recommendation, okay. it's about the information presented tonight. It was Perfect. not enough for me. Okay. Too high level, high broken level. down, thank you. Dr. Bates. I have a number of questions. Um, I would like to know, not only I would second or third Marlon's question about what the downsides are, um, and Gwen's question about other ranges of, of dollars, which may be, available, I would like to know more about what the alternative uses of the um, tax revenue by the other jurisdictions would be and the ways in which we may prefer those uses by the county or school district or any other jurisdiction that it will continue to not have this property taxes um, and the ways that those may help um, advance racial justice. So that's a completely alternative. It's not just an alternative to having additional funds here, but there are other, entirely other programmatic areas of work that the city of Portland will never do that we may be interested in. Um, my second question is uh, to repeat questions I have asked at the Oversight Committee for PHB um, are what the city's plans are to increase this funding to projects of community development, economic development, housing development in this area and towards African American people everywhere in the city, not only with money that is in the Housing Bureau, federal allocations, general fund, but also um, going back to the original intent of this project, which was, again, um, as I was told when invited to be on this committee, was to turn $20 million into $200 million, and that there would be massive efforts by the city of Portland to leverage funds to have foundations and philanthropic giving and you know, make this a, a showpiece and national center of, of significant investment. So I would like to know about plans for that work. I would also like to hear more about the possibility of having binding community benefits agreements, particularly on projects through Prosper Portland, which they have not been willing to do in the past. Um, I would like to understand more about the relationship of this conversation to the Hill Block project and to other related future activities such as conversations around the Albina Vision uh, Memorial Coliseum, you know, reboot times, however many times historically that's going to be, um, you know, and sort of that broader sense of areas that may in the future also need um, other kinds of public funding. Thank you very much. Oscar, we haven't heard from you tonight. I think the presentations were helpful. I think that I actually have a lot more questions now with the additional information that was shared today. Um, I don't think I can process all of that as well as Lisa just sort of uh, did. 
Uh, but I, I agree that um, the information is very high level and that um, we're moving towards uh, a direction where we're gonna have to make some very serious recommendations and until we get a little bit more granular and we get a little bit more about what the impact of these programs are having on people um, that you know we're not gonna be, I'm not gonna be able to like um, be comfortable uh, moving forward with this recommendation. Perfect. Karen, we haven't heard from you. Any comment? No comment? Okay, thank you. Jennifer and then yeah. Sheila. And I think a lot of people have already said something very similar to this, but I'd like to see more about the spe specifics of why, of how the increased financing would get spent, how they got to that place, um, and what it's meant for, um, and if it aligns with the community. Because I, I think from tonight's testimonies, we've been hearing that um, there is money, but why is it being sent, spent here, or why is there a preponderance of it being spent in a certain bucket and not the other buckets? Um, so really diving deep into how it is intended to be spent would be something I would like to see in how um, those decisions were made. Thank you. Sheila? I appreciate having both groups be able to hear the presentations tonight. And my question is, now that we have the questions that people still have, what would be next steps? What have you envisioned as the next steps after this? Are you asking me specifically what have I envisioned? Well, or what is envisioned by? Okay, what is envisioned? <laughs> I think that is to be determined. I think there's some follow-up discussion. So uh, the reason why the joint, the joint meeting uh, tonight, that was my suggestion that we have actually all three groups come together and work through this information because it is so significant and it is so vital and there are so many nuances associated with it. Uh, to have us in the same room, same book, same time, same information, to have the same discussion because each one has its own impact. Um, the Northeast CDI has a specific charge, the Project Working Group has a specific charge, and then the Housing Oversight Committee has a specific charge. And then there are some overlaps as it relates to the work that we do. So it would be beneficial to have the conversation. In my mind, I don't think one presentation can take us to a place of resolution slash determinations. So it would be great to have ongoing discussion. I can't determine that. That's my thought. So. That's my hope, is that we'll have ongoing conversation. Does that help? It does. Okay. Janisha. Um, first, I want to say thank you for everybody being here. I'm really happy to see the community here and represent it with questions as well. Uh, there's many times where the community is not represented. There is no voices heard. And, and, um, and again, you get the three minutes to have your voice heard in the first place. So I'm really glad that the community has something to say that is present in making us accountable um, for the work that we're supposed to do that we have not done, that we want to do, <laughs> you know? And um, I'm just happy that I, I think there's a lot that I learned today from everybody and the organizations, and what, but I think there's a lot more that can be distributed to the community where that their voice is heard and they're able to know that there are things that there's money available because I don't think even with the money that is available that the community is aware that they have options, even if there may be minimum. So again, I'm glad that we had this, the community involved. Any other voice from oversight committees prior to our closing? Yes, Sheila. So a next step in my mind would be that we would definitely need to have the list of questions and uh, the gaps that were identified by both those sitting around the table and um, the public that was here testifying tonight and get that out to everyone so that they can noodle it, if you will, and see if there are other issues. And hopefully at some point this body will come back together and do an update on where we are because we got to keep moving, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. At some point, a decision has to be made. 
Right. At some point, a determination has to be made in regard to how things are going to be funded, how things are going to be purchased, built, how dollars are going to be expended. And when dollars are expended, they are just that, expended. Um, as it relates to these processes. Uh, so yeah, we've got to, got to come back together and do some work. Thanks everyone for being here tonight. We appreciate your time and your investment and energy. If you have further questions and you have further thoughts, there are ways to communicate. You've got some email addresses where you can email and some phone numbers where you can call individuals. Um, appreciate it, have a great Thursday night.